A lot of people around the world are talking about Ukraine today, Taiwan tomorrow. Someone is provoking the bottom line of China. They are urging the Taiwanese independence movement to become bolder and bolder. They have to decide. They, Taiwan, not us. And we are not encouraging independence. We're encouraging that they do exactly what the Taiwan Act requires. Japan's relations with China have been very, very sour. It is quite natural for the Japanese people to uh, worry uh, about uh, Taiwan contingency. Taiwan is China's business, not only China's Scenes that shook the world. <laughs> but in Taiwan, a territory situated more than 8,000 kilometers away, Russia's invasion of Ukraine was met with more than just shock and horror. It triggered waves of panic among some segments of society. They continue to grapple with the question, when will Taiwan be next? To prepare themselves, some Taiwanese have signed up for special courses on how to survive a war zone. Known as I Can Help workshops, these courses impart participants with skills to save lives and the knowledge to navigate hostile environments. Okay. Enoch Wu, a former Special Forces officer, has been leading these classes for the past year. In the wake of the Ukraine crisis, he's observed a renewed interest in these courses got a very strong demand signal from the public that uh, they wanted to, to be better trained, to be better prepared, and, and to know how to help each other in, in events of emergencies. And so we moved up our class schedule from uh, by a couple months. And uh, you know, as soon as we opened up our April classes, they were filled within an hour or two. We're all heartened and touched and moved by average Ukrainians' will to protect their country and their homes. And so what transpired over the past couple months and as a Taiwanese, it's that much clear that we need to be better prepared against any uh, crises during peacetime so that we can prevent uh, war from happening in the first place, so we can maintain our peace. Some people in Taiwan, or actually a lot of people around the world, are talking about Ukraine today, Taiwan tomorrow. I, I don't agree on that. But still, you know, that has caused some mental threat, psychological threat to the people in Taiwan. Because quite of our people are afraid that what if there would be an invasion from the Chinese mainland on Taiwan? So we would 
not like to see any war happening on this piece of land. In the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, observers around the world were quick to point out the similarities between Ukraine and Taiwan. But Beijing has sought to de-link the two conflicts. Taiwan problem and Ukraine problem have a The Taiwan is a part of Chinese Taiwan is Lately, both China and the United States have been trading blame for the heightened tensions in the Taiwan Strait. The U.S. is calling China out for this. Taiwan's defense ministry says Chinese fighter jets have approached the island for a second day in a row. And a record number of China aircraft enter Taiwan's air defense zone. The island is on high alert, raising concerns around the region. I hear you that uh, China seeks peaceful reunification, but why then do we see so many frequent incidents of Chinese warplanes flying to Taiwan airspace? Because someone is uh, prov provoking the bottom line of China. For many years, the United States acknowledged and agreed that they will have no government-to-government -government relations with Taiwan, and they will only have economic, trade, cultural exchanges with Taiwan. Now you see more and more U.S. civilian government officials, even military, government, uh, military officials, delegations of all kinds visiting Taiwan. They are urging the Taiwanese uh, independence movement to become bolder and bolder. I think Washington finds this narrative frustrating, but somewhat laughable at this point. Everything is Washington's fault, right? If, if China engages in more uh, bomber patrols around Taipei, that's somehow Washington's fault. If we talk about the military tensions, the military tension in the Taiwan Straits uh, generally caused, is caused by the People's Liberation Army, who has had the mission to take Taiwan back if necessary. So we have seen uh, the recent uh, the PLA presence around Taiwan. Uh, so that's a very important sign for Taiwan society to know that the goal of the PRC to reunite with Taiwan has never stopped. Over the past five years, relations between Beijing and Taipei have broken down. As Taiwan's ruling Democratic Progressive Party, or DPP, hardened its stance against the mainland. Within the Taiwanese community, voices pushing for independence have also been getting louder. And Beijing's patience is wearing thin. The reality is, the majority of Taiwan's population are wary about rocking the boat with China. In fact, in 2019, Voters were so dissatisfied with the DPP government's tough stance against Beijing and its cost on Taiwan's economy that they nearly voted President Chai Ing-wen out of office. Events in neighboring Hong Kong helped turn the tide in Chai's favor. And now, 
the Russian invasion of Ukraine has created yet another opportunity for Chai to maintain her political momentum. Her first move was to revise the territory's reservist laws and raise military spending, all in the name of defending Taiwan's democracy. And while the moves were expected, it was the fanfare and fashion of those announcements that raised eyebrows. President Tsai appeared in a military uniform announcing her plan, increasing military budget, and a possible change in the voluntary service regulations. But I think it's more a way uh, for the public relations of the Chinese administration so that our people can feel more confident that this government is doing something beneficial and positive for Taiwan during the crisis between Ukraine and Russia. Uh, another reason why President Tsai did that is that the U.S. has been asking Taiwan to increase Taiwan's national defense budget to a higher level so that Taiwan can show its true determination for self-defense. As a vital hub for manufacturing semiconductors, Taiwan is far more important to the global economy than Ukraine is. And the U.S is already taking action to protect these global interests, much to China's displeasure. Inside one of Taiwan's top institutions, Preparations are being made for war with China. The 700,000 treasures here represent 8,000 years of Chinese history. Following reports that even museums were not spared during the bombardments in Ukraine, leading to the destruction of thousands of cultural artifacts, the museum established a special task force to devise plans to evacuate its treasures in the event of war. Xiao Qingwang is a leading archaeologist in Taiwan, so he's watching these plans closely. We have the most important part of the Kukong Museum. He has been looking at these treasures. It's actually very valuable, especially his many treasures and some of the connections with the Huaxia culture and the connections with the Huaxia culture. 其实，呃，如果有这些的武装冲突的时候，那我们一定要先前的哦，防范未来，然后能够居安思危，哦，去思考可能有一天我们的一个文化也可能会受到摧毁。The fact that collections belonging to generations of Chinese emperors now sit in a museum 2,000 kilometers away from the Forbidden City says a lot about Taiwan's complex history. Over the past four centuries, the island was governed by the Dutch, Spanish, China's Qing Dynasty, and even the Japanese before returning to Chinese rule. Then in 1950, it became the seat of a government in exile after China's nationalist forces led by Chiang Kai-shek fled the mainland following a crushing defeat by the Chinese Communist Party. Today, Beijing continues to seek reunification. At the Chinese Communist Party's 100th anniversary celebrations in 2021, President Xi Jinping makes clear how he sees the Taiwan issue being resolved.
The majority of the world, including the United States, recognized the One China policy. In fact, Taiwan figured prominently in three joint statements made by the U.S. and China between 1972 and 1982. Known as the Three Communiques, they enshrine a commitment to these key principles. There can only be one China. The People's Republic of China is the sole legal government of China. And the U.S. would continue selling arms to Taiwan at a level consistent with China's militarization of the Taiwan Strait. Forty years on, the United States still abides by the three communiques. They have to decide. They, Taiwan, not us. And we are not encouraging independence. We're encouraging that they do exactly what the Taiwan Act requires. And that's what we're doing. Let them make up their mind, period. The U.S. position on the One China policy is often misstated, I think intentionally so, in China. The U.S. One China policy does not say that Taiwan is part of China or that China is part of Taiwan. The U.S. One China policy says that the U.S. recognizes that Beijing and Taipei each believe that there is only one China, that the U.S. is neutral on the final settlement, but that the settlement must be peaceful, and that the U.S. will do things to help ensure that. And the U.S.-Taiwan Relations Act of 1979 made that very concrete. The U.S. will take steps to ensure that Taiwan can defend itself against invasion. In recent months, the U.S. has upset Beijing by sending delegations of high-ranking U.S. officials to Taiwan. Speaker Nancy Pelosi is the latest on a guest list that has attracted the ire of China. The U.S. strategy is more and more clear. Uh, that's due to uh, Russia to use of force in the Ukraine. And then they want to seduce Taiwan independence. And then maybe us, uh, in, uh, actually, let China to use of force to, uh, to unify the Taiwan. Uh, China is very uh, cautious. China is very patient. Not let the U.S. strategy be succeeded. Why does the U.S. keep sending senior officials to Taiwan? There was an enormous amount of anxiety in Taipei and in other capitals throughout Asia that the Ukraine crisis would either be taken as an excuse by China for greater provocation toward Taiwan, or that it would raise questions about U.S. distraction. That if the U.S., uh, in confronting this, this really generational upheaval in Europe, would take its eye off the ball yet again in Asia. U.S. is committed to doing both. Uh, that China remains the top competitor, that Russia is a spoiler and has to be dealt with, but that the U.S. remains committed to the resiliency of Taiwan and helping Taiwan deter Chinese aggression. I can assure you, no U.S. president will send any single American soldier to fight for the independence of Taiwan. Why? Because it will be completely against the fundamental interests of the American people. The American people do not want to see their sons and daughters die for the so-called independence of Taiwan. U.S. arms sales to Taiwan also angers China. Condemnation from China over the United States' latest planned arms sale to Taiwan. Beijing has told Washington to immediately revoke the sales plan for the island's missile upgrades. Now, the Chinese say that they will take robust measures to uphold their security interests. Based on the Taiwan Relations Act, the U.S. is able to provide with Taiwan necessary defensive nature of weapons so that Taiwan can carry enough defense capability to deter aggression of mainland China. This is very important. Uh, with this U.S. defense assistance, can Taiwan be more confident in negotiating or interacting with the Beijing authorities? Without these weapons, Taiwan is just like a tiger without teeth and the Beijing authorities will have so many different means to make Taiwan kowtow to Beijing authorities.
they want to send more weapons to Taiwan. Actually, the Americans will make a lot of money out of arms sale to Taiwan. My advice to the U.S. on how to manage the Taiwan issue is to let sleeping dogs lie, to allow the status quo to continue as soon as, as long as possible, because the status quo has kept peace. There are very few predictions I dare to make in geopolitics very confidently. One prediction I make very confidently is that if the government in Taiwan declares that Taiwan no longer represents the Republic of China, but instead is an independent sovereign state, China will declare war. And for all of us who want to prevent wars in this region, let's advise Taiwan to keep to the status quo. Strategic ambiguity is the thing that allows the U.S. both to help deter, dissuade China from using force, but also not back China into a corner so much that it feels it has no choice but to use force. And so the goal really has to be to continue to buy time, to buy time indefinitely for facts on the ground to change such that a cross-strait peaceful resolution becomes possible. And it has to remain very clear that there will be terrible repercussions for Beijing should it resort to force. It's not gonna spell out exactly what that playbook is. I don't think uh, the war will happen so long as the Beijing authorities see some possibilities of peaceful unification with Taiwan. Th that is why we have seen uh, some rounds of discussions on mainland China about uh, one country, two system, Taiwan formula. At least uh, the Beijing authorities is still trying to find a peaceful way to wound the support of some Taiwan people and trying to make sure that peaceful unification still works. Both China and the U.S. hope for the Taiwan conflict to be resolved without the use of force. Developments would be closely monitored by the world, especially neighboring countries. Japan and South Korea are now increasing their military budgets as tensions in East Asia increase. As the horrors in Ukraine unfolded, a long taboo topic came up for debate. The issue is whether to allow Japan to introduce a nuclear sharing arrangement to deploy U.S. nuclear weapons on its soil and jointly operate them. <laughs> nuclear sharing was established within NATO in the late 1950s. Under the arrangement, Germany and some other non-nuclear NATO states store U.S. nuclear weapons in their territories and maintain their own means of weapons delivery. I think Japanese politicians watching what's happened with Ukraine has uh, brought home the, the take-home lesson to some Japanese politicians that uh, nuclear deterrent may be uh, uh, an important way to push back against not only uh, North Korea, which is developing um, weapons of mass destruction, but also uh, pushing back against what the Japanese understand as the sort of Chinese behavior in the East China Sea, South China Sea, and across the Taiwan Straits. The government of Prime Minister Kishida has taken a stand against the idea, and it's because of this. The horrors of Hiroshima, an atomic bomb city, are still remembered. Though 77 years have passed since the day, the memory has not faded.
Yasuhiro Asieda, who's 76, comes early in the morning every year on the date of the anniversary. He was only 11 months old when the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima on 6 August 1945, flattening the city and killing 140,000 people. Prime Minister Kishida comes from Hiroshima, and the issue of nuclear weapons is a red line he cannot cross. After World War II, peace was prized here. Japan adopted three nuclear principles of not possessing, not producing, and not permitting the introduction of nuclear weapons into its territory. But developments in Taiwan are troubling the Japanese. Polls found that 9 in 10 Japanese fear China will invade Taiwan. Japan's relations with China have been very, very sour uh, for uh, the past two, more than the past two decades. And uh, the, uh, Japan has been facing a serious challenge uh, coming from China in terms of uh, you know, Senkaku Island related uh, issue and also other uh, security related issues. In Japan, uh, there are less than 10% of the people feel affinity toward China and uh, distrust against China is very deep. On the contrary, uh, Japanese affinity to uh, Taiwan is really high, more than 80%. And uh, the people-to-people -people relations are really good. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, it is quite natural for the Japanese people to uh, worry uh, about uh, Taiwan contingency. Um, there's strong security concerns about China in Japan, but in the same polls, Japanese recognize China as the most important economic partner within the region. And, you know, $210 billion of Japanese exports went to China last year. And this is despite the COVID-19 pandemic and despite these unfavorable ratings. This um, economic relationship is something that's very, very difficult to detangle. And I just don't think the Japanese are interested in detangling. Rather, they want to make sure that they can um, have the benefits, but also be in a position of caution vis-a-vis uh, -vis China on critical issues to Japan's interests, like Taiwan. Over in China, Japan's actions during World War II continue to color opinions. After a statement by former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe that a crisis in Taiwan would be an emergency for Japan and for the U.S.-Japan alliance, the Chinese government responded by criticizing various Japanese misdeeds, from its wartime aggression to the decision to release contaminated water from Fukushima into the Pacific Ocean. Taiwan Japan's participation in the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, or the Quad, has also drawn anger from China. Then there's the Senkaku, or Tiao Yui Tao, island disputes. They are currently controlled by Japan, but China also claims sovereignty over the islands. China's pressure towards Senkaku Islands is still very strong. They sent their vessels into the contiguous zones uh, in the uh, Senkaku Islands, and they're staying there all the time. 
uh, there used to be uh, non-equipped weapons, but uh, uh, now they equip weapons. And Japanese government uh, sent a demarche, diplomatic demarche, to Beijing every day. Every day. What we generally see if Japan does, uh, for example, has a joint exercise within the Quad, we will see those uh, merchant vessels in increased numbers go in and out of the waters surrounding the Senkaku Islands. And when there's relative um, less tension in the relationship, the numbers go down. So uh, it's a, a gauge to see how much displeasure there is in Beijing about Japan's uh, cooperation within the Quad or um, statements on Taiwan. So I think the leaders are very reticent to criticize each country because they want to maintain those strong economic relations. So we see very little criticism about President Xi by Japanese politicians and very little criticism about Japanese politicians by Chinese counterparts. But they send their displeasure through uh, these great, an increased number of, of vessels in and around Japanese waters, or in the case of Taiwan, of course, circumnavigating Taiwan with fighter planes. China and Japan mark the 50th anniversary of normalization of diplomatic ties this year. But the mood is not celebratory. In 2021, some 71% of Japanese said China posed a threat up from 63% in 2020. Likewise, 66% of Chinese had negative views of Japan, up from 53%. Perhaps economic ties might soothe relations. China hopes to further strengthen economic ties through the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. China and Japan are among its 15 member nations. I do think that there is bright spots in terms of thinking about uh, Sino-Japanese relations. First, at the trade level, uh, they continue to cooperate in the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Uh, this will spearhead further integration within the region. There is some talk about a trilateral free trade agreement between South Korea, China, and Japan. So in that sense, there's still a, a commitment to engaging with China at the trade level. Japan remains uh, committed to the Chinese economy. Uh, and the Chinese government, especially at the local level, is very committed to a strong uh, economic relations between China and Japan. It's Japanese businesses that have hired millions of Chinese in China. Uh, they provide technological infusion, uh, human capacity building, and uh, local governments in China welcome that investment. So those ties remain strong, but of course uh, the direction of, of China today is moving towards a more uh, inward-looking, I think nationalist uh, view, and this will impact, uh, I think, those strong uh, ties that have maintained a, a relative balance between the two states up to now. In March 2022, South Korea elected a new president. Yoon suk yeol promised to be tougher on China during his campaign. Korea, 그리고 중국 사람들, 중국의 청년들의 대부분이 또 한국을 싫어합니다. 근데 과거에는 그렇지 않았습니다. 이렇게 중국 편향적이 편향적인 정책을 쓰고 In his first press conference after his victory, Yoon said that he wants to bolster South Korea's defense capabilities and strengthen cooperation with the United States and Japan. 국민의 안전과 재산 영토와 주권을 지키기 위해 어떠한 도발도 확실하게 억제할 수 있는 강력한 국방력을 구축하겠습니다. After years of careful and strategic political maneuvering, tending to relations with China, the US and North Korea, President Yoon was redrawing lines. This realignment comes on the back of a string of cultural clashes. 
Recently, I would say more from the South Korean public side, there have been a series of these incidents that have really um, upset people. You know, claims about kimchi being Chinese. Uh, during the Winter Olympics, this flared up over the presentation of hanbok, of Korean traditional dress, being presented as one of the uh, ethnic minority costumes in the opening ceremony. Remarks and representations which might have assaulted cultural nerves of South Koreans. Some of these cultural storms, I think, would just be that. They'd be a storm in a teacup, and everyone would just move on. But each one of these incidents just slowly, it keeps tipping the lever. And we've seen this in polling to indicate the general view of China among the South Korean public is increasingly negative. Incidents on the high seas contribute to that negativity. As Chinese demand for seafood increases, its fishing fleet finds itself pushing the limits of its territorial boundaries. This is another one of these chronic irritants that goes back for decades in the relationship. And we've seen that actually become quite violent and you've seen loss of life uh, at sea on both sides, but in particular, you've seen South Korean Coast Guards um, die in these clashes. So it's a, it's a real problem, it's a chronic problem. The China's fishing vessels illegal encroachment that caused the economic loss to the South Korean fishermen. So it caused a kind of anti-China sentiment at the civilian level. South Korea and China started to proceed the maritime boundary negotiations, and they made efforts to root out those Chinese fishing vessels, illegal invasion. But it is defense issues that create complex diplomatic scuffles between South Korea and China. In 2016, South Korea deployed THAAD, an anti-missile system designed to shoot down incoming missiles. It was a system that was supposed to shield them from North Korean missiles. South Korea deployed a THAAD system for its national security, but China approached it through the prism of US-China relations they perceived that the South system was to spy on um, its territory. The Chinese authorities retaliated by closing nearly half of Lotte's 112 stores across China. South Korean firms suffered losses of an estimated 7.5 billion US dollars. Lotte was probably the poster child of here's what we'll do to you, South Korea if you make a national security decision that we don't approve of. You know, we will take it out on you economically. That was the message that South Korea received over THAAD, and it's certainly not been forgotten. It left a very bad long-term impression and negativity toward China that they'd be willing to do that, that they would be willing to create that kind of economic pain on South Korea for a national security decision. After the South incident, I think South Korea learned the, the risk of economic dependence on China. With the intensifying US-China relations, well, it turns out you know, South Korea should make more careful approach to South Korea-China relations within the structure of US-China confrontation. While former President Moon Jae-in has tried to pacify the Chinese, much of that diplomacy might come to naught because of incoming President Yoon suk yeol The new president was voted in on rising anti-Chinese sentiment. Uh, 
그런 관계가 다시 자리를 잡아야 될 것으로 저는 생각합니다. In the lead up to the elections, President Yoon had pledged to deploy additional units of the THAAD anti-missile system. I think it is a kind of rhetoric to secure the conservative vote by emphasizing the difference from the Moon Jae-in government. The priority of his foreign, foreign policy is to abandon the strategic ambiguity and reinforce the South Korea-U.S. alliance. If the new administration makes a decision, yeah, we want as many, as many THAAD batteries as we can take, the Chinese are almost certainly going to return to the kind of economic punishment that they did before. Uh, that's going to cost South Koreans on the economic ledger. And is that a cost that they really want to absorb right now? You know, is, is, what's the cost-benefit analysis? Will it be a risk South Korea is willing to take? South Korea abandoned its nuclear weapons development in the 1970s. But a survey conducted in December 2021 showed 71% of South Koreans were in favor of the country developing its own nuclear weapons. The perception shift in South Korea I think was caused by the fact that there is no sign of improvement uh, in denuclearizing North Korea. South Korea's nuclear armament can be a great military pressure on North Korea and China. But at the same time, it is highly likely to intensify military tensions and arms race in the region instead. But for now, I don't see that as, again, something that the new administration right out of the gates is going to say, OK, great, we're here, and South Korea wants its own nuclear weapons. That would be a, a highly destabilizing geopolitical move for the region, and I'm not sure that that really serves South Korea's interests. Whether or not South Korea participates in the Quad, or Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, is also a subject of debate. The Quad has Australia, Japan, India, and the U.S. as member countries. There's also questions of whether the Quad actually wants South Korea as a member. I would not say that Japan-South Korea relations are particularly good, and Japan is obviously a core member of the Quad. So does Tokyo really want South Korea diluting the Quad brand with its presence? I think that's actually an open question. Chinese state media warn South Korea that joining the Quad will damage relations. Well, I think we've definitely shifted towards uh, what we call a bipolar system. Uh, the two big poles, of course, of the United States and China. So what does this mean uh, if we moved into a bipolar world? Uh, it suggests that the United States and like-minded countries are going to build deterrence capabilities, build engagement capabilities, and of course, um, when there's disagreements with China, push back against China's uh, actions. And China as well is going to start to build its own network of countries, I think mostly emerging countries through the BRI, uh, as well as insulate its economy from uh, future uh, fiscal sanctions that they've watched be very effective against the Russian economy uh, to create a Chinese sphere of influence through the BRI. And this is how I understand global order moving forward. Whether there will be a new international order, I do not know. I love the current international order. China has benefited a great deal by fully becoming integrated with the international order, we understand it, and China will be a champion of defending the current international order. What China does not like is for any country in the world try to dictate its will onto any other country in the world. Now, that may apply to the United States. We do not want to see a unilateral world involving any single power, holding itself as a hegemon, dictating its terms to all the other countries. We actually do not like to see any country holding itself out as possessing the total truth, the complete truth, nothing but the truth. Why? Because we simply do not believe it. 
a new world order can be very confusing because our world order is actually very dynamic and changing. Believe me, when China becomes the number one economy in the world, that will be another significant shift in, in, in the world. So we are clearly experiencing major changes, but at the same time, we can try to make these changes all peaceful. We need to step up the level of diplomatic engagement and have far more dialogues, more face-to-face -face diplomacy in East Asia.